On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's event with Neil Swidey discussing his new book, Trapped Under the Sea, One Engineering Marvel, Five Men and a Disaster, Ten Miles into the Darkness. Uh, and so we're going to, I'm going to take you, start off here just to take you back a little bit because I think we forget um, just what the harbor looked like not that long ago. Um, if you think back, you know, uh, Boston Harbor was where it all began uh, in, in many ways for the whole maritime economy of, of uh, the colonies uh, and uh, Boston's history, sort of indivisible both from Boston's history and American history. And yet, uh, through the 20th century, it was allowed to become a cesspool of, of human waste. All right, now my prediction didn't. Here we go. Michael Dukakis called Boston Harbor an open sewer. As governor, he had the opportunity to do something about it, but chose not to. Now, Boston Harbor, the dirtiest harbor in America, will cost residents $6 billion to clean. And Michael Dukakis promises to do for America what he's done for Massachusetts. People remember that ad? James probably does hear it. Political uh, uh, correspondent and uh, uh, someone who knows uh, politics uh, as well as anyone. That ad was run uh, by the Bush uh, campaign in '88, uh, and it was devastating to Dukakis. Uh, they, I think, they were going to run it just on a lark. They, they and then they it tested so well. They ran it every night of the Olympics in '88, um, and because it was it. it uh, underscored just what uh, the embarrassment that Boston Harbor had become. And for all the Dukakis fans in this crowd, I'm guessing there are more Dukakis fans than Bush fans here, just a guess. Uh, uh, it was sort of unfair because the, the harbor cleanup had begun, um, uh, but it had taken a while. And what was, what was fair was the footage. It was real, authentic footage. All Bush had to do was invite the national press around uh, to follow him on a barge around the harbor to see what it become. Actual footage from the harbor in the late 80s. This is Boston Harbor today. That's right off Deer Island. It is one of the biggest environmental success stories in the country, and people forget that because it's so the the, the change is so dramatic, uh, and it took a while for it to actually happen. Um, it's also, uh, as I'm sure you realize, um, all the energy in Boston now has moved to the Seaport District, all the new restaurants and the condos and the buildings. That doesn't happen without the cleanup of the harbor. It goes back to um, what it was before with the, uh, uh, you know, muddy parking lots and, you know, grubby warehouses. Um, this was in the New York Times uh, just a few weeks ago. A once an open sewer today, the harbor is the pride of Boston a playground for pleasure boaters and even swimmers as it glistens like a necklace ringed by glassy towers, upscale restaurants, and pricey hotels. And the point of this article was Menino's success, you know, retiring, you don't understand it if there was no clean harbor, that so much of the development was made possible because that happened. So how did it happen? There's two parts. Anyone who uh, likes walking around Deer Island or anyone who flies um, out of Logan, you've seen this before, right? These giant uh, egg digesters. That's the visible component of the cleanup of the harbor, this multi-billion dollar project um, where it's a f sophisticated sewage treatment plant that was built there. The invisible component that most people don't know about is this. This is a nearly 10 mile tunnel that is, uh, starts at a uh, shaft that's built 420 feet down, like a skyscraper down uh, at Deer Island, and then starts going underneath the bedrock of Massachusetts Bay, hundreds of feet below the floor of the ocean, and just keeps going and going out into the middle of the, of the bay. Um, the tunnel is 
uh, it, we call it a, an engineering marvel because that's what it is. It moves up to a billion gallons of treated wastewater through uh, the tunnel deep out into the harbor without a single pump or electrical source in it. It's all based on gravity. So, so the size of the tunnel has to be um, uh, constructed perf perfectly in order to keep that flow moving. At the end of the tunnel, uh, it connects with these 55 vertical pipes. So it's this long horizontal pump tunnel and uh, these um, 55 pipes that climb up to the floor of the ocean. Two different companies, joint ventures really, building these two parts of this massive project. Um, and one is working nine miles out into the bay. One is starting to dig underneath Deer Island and moving out and they hope that they'd meet. There's no GPS underneath hundreds of feet below uh, the ocean floor. Uh, so they have to work with this precision and you know crossed fingers to make sure that they actually meet because at the end the whole idea with this is you limit so you're going to Instead of how it used to be before, where they sort of barely treated sewage and sometimes untreated sewage was just allowed to go right into the harbor, the idea here is you you every toilet that flushes in eastern half of Massachusetts ends up at Deer Island, where it's put through this sophisticated treatment, and then just in case it's moved far away from Boston Harbor out into the deep ocean. And then just in case uh, uh, to sort of keep that flow and limit any impact on any of the wildlife out there, um, a little bit goes up the first of the pipes, a little bit goes up the second, all the way to those 55 pipes. On the seafloor where those, each of those pipes is capped with this diffuser head. There are the sprinkler heads. Again, this is all um, part of uh, the way of moving this through and um, limiting its impact. But there was a um, problem, uh, and it didn't seem like a big problem at the time, and that's one of the things I explore in the book, is when you're doing this massive project, multi-billion dollar project, some of the world's best design, engineering, and construction firms, um, uh, how do you know what the big problems are going to be in the end? And uh, a lot of the drama ri uh, sort of rests ultimately on these plugs. These 65 pound, they look like you see here, like industrial kitchen salad bowls. Um, those were a secondary safety protection. Um, everywhere that that horizontal tunnel met those vertical risers, um, there was a safety plug in there because for the years that this tunnel was being built, uh, uh, there were sand hogs, people who build tunnels, uh, you know, the sort of subterranean workers who live down there. Um, there, to protect them from the ocean water coming in, there were the, that diffuser cap, the head that I told you about that was on the ocean floor, those were designed to protect them, and then the, there were covers on those, another design, but just, just in case there was this additional one. But the key thing was, no one ever figured out how those were going to get removed. Um, uh, and it seemed like a very small detail at the time when you're thinking about a contract to build this tunnel. It was about a thousand pages long, and this is one provision in it. Um, but the, the contract did specify something very, um, uh, very important in the end, and that was that the tunnel had to be completely done before those plugs were removed. And completely done, I sort of equate it to if you're selling your house, broom clean condition, you know how you have to make sure you don't have any boxes or appliances hanging out. It has to be, and, and, and in order for the contractor to get paid, the tunnel had to essentially be in broom clean condition. And that meant that the, what was happening during the tunnel construction for that, it was supposed to take five years, it took closer to 10, workers were down there, hundreds of feet below the floor of the ocean, but they had a couple of key things. You see them in here. You see light, you see those rail tracks, that's transportation that takes you those nine miles back and forth, and you, you have breathable air. There's ventilation in the tunnel, so you can walk around down there. Um, those, all those life support systems are pulled out at the end, but the plugs are still in, so the whole 
tunnel will not work. The whole multi-billion dollar cleanup of the harbor won't work unless those plugs are out. This is just a, a quick point of comparison for just to put things in perspective. People know the deepest ocean point on Earth, the Mariana Trench, the Challenger Deep. That's um, 36,000 feet. So if you think about when you fly in a plane in cruising altitude, that's about 35,000 feet. So Challenger Deep is the reverse, deep down into the, the ocean, about that um, depth. Deer Island Tunnel, the distance at the end of the tunnel from the surface is 49,626 feet. So it's almost 40% farther than the deepest ocean point on Earth from surface. Now it's not all the way down, it's, mostly, it's down and then out is most of the distance, but it's, if you think about it, in order to get back to the surface, it's farther than the much farther than the deepest ocean point on Earth. The tunnel starts 24 feet wide, but in order for that uh, engineering marvel to work, the size of the tunnel has to get narrower and narrower as you get through. So at the end, it chokes down to five feet in diameter. I couldn't stand up straight at the end of the tunnel. And then when it connects with those pipes, those connector pipes, those are 30 inches wide, so just about, just slightly wider than my shoulders. That's where those plugs, and the plugs are maybe 40 feet, 20 to 40 feet between that in to those 30 inch wide pipes. So why were the plugs still left in and everything else was pulled out? And as I said, some of the best and brightest minds, uh, construction and design firms had worked on this. But at the end of this project, um, which was over budget, uh, for the tunnel piece of it, uh, which was um, um, past deadlines, court order deadlines, a lot of pressure on the job, and a lot of frayed relationships. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of cooperation left. And that's one of the, again, one of the things I sort of try to explore in the book is how do, how do these things happen? How do people who make very good decisions all along in order to do this amazing um, uh, and incredibly complicated and ambitious project, um, in the end, bake into the, the project a problem. Um, and part of that has to do with the organization behavior, you know, how people get along or don't get along. So the decision is to bring in a dive team to return, to remove those plugs. Now why a dive team? The, pl the tunnel isn't full yet, uh, as I said, up to a billion gallons of treated wastewater flows through it now, every day. But at the time, there were maybe just ankle deep parts of you know water, seepage water that was kind of in there, standing water. They went to divers because commercial divers are sort of a special breed. These are guys who do almost always guys, not always, but 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 largely, um, who do really complicated work um, in. Uh, dicey situations where they have to bring in their own breathing air. So the thinking was, let's go to these guys and let's let them solve it. So they bring in a dive team and a couple of key things on it. So here's the dive team, Billy, Tim, Riggs, Haas, and DJ. Really interesting guys, all of them experienced guys. Um, but two different dive companies are kind of put together for this job. One from the West Coast and one from New Hampshire. Uh, and um, they've never worked with each other before. They have about a week or two of training to sort of get to know each other. And they're um, really interesting characters. Um, and they're, they're intrigued by this job because they're told you're gonna make history in your field. You're gonna do something that's never been done before, which is pretty heady for someone in, in, a, in a field where there's always someone doing something that seems very difficult, but to, to impress all the other people in the fraternity is, is pretty remarkable. Um, so they come in. And I just wanna just quickly give you a little sense of who some of these guys are. I'll start with the um, lower right-hand corner, DJ. 
And DJ is kind of a player. He's a ladies' man. He's a, a, a character. Um, and he's a guy who likes to have fun. Uh, but once he's on the job, he's a pretty serious guy. But getting him to the job is sometimes pretty complicated and, and never a straight line. Um, so in the beginning of the book, I'm talking about his boss sort of getting frustrated with him because he's, he's taking his time to, to, to start on this job. I mentioned that over the years, they had developed a rhythm as predictable as the banter between an anchor woman and a weatherman on the eve of a big storm. DJ, a six foot two, solidly built charmer, would show up late to the job site, occasionally dropped off by some blonde or brunette he'd been partying with the night before. As DJ peeled off yesterday's clothes and put on his dive gear, Tap, his boss, would curse, threatening to kick him off the job. But those outbursts always ended the same way. Before long, Tap would calm down and begin tump pumping DJ for details from his latest adventure, hopping bars and hopping beds. Um, on the day of the, of, of the job, this sort of explains a little bit on DJ in connection with some of the other guys. The man cage spun slowly as it moved down the shaft like a gentle whirlpool of water circling around a drain. DJ was a talker, but he felt no urge to speak. He stared across the cage at the other two divers. The man cage was taking them down the shaft. Guys he'd known for only a couple of weeks. He had an especially, time getting, especially tough time getting a bead on the shorter of the two, Dave Riggs. While divers tended to be a rowdy bunch pounding beers and swapping stories after their shift, Riggs didn't drink and kept to himself. During one of their first days working together, DJ had been doing what he always did telling lots of tales and peppered with colorful words. When Riggs turned to him and said, I'd appreciate it if you didn't use foul language within my earshot. DJ narrowed his eyes and stared back at Riggs in disbelief. Then he said the first thing that came into his head, are you effing kidding me? He didn't say effing, but I have some of my sisters from the <laughs> Sisters of St. Joseph are here and we're being recorded, so I know better than to, but you can read the page and see. Uh, He'd been a diver for seven years now, and he'd never once come across anyone who had confused a job site with a church pew. He had a better connection with the other guy in the cage, Donald Hossford, known as Hoss to everyone except his mother. Hoss had a ropey six-foot-two build and the rugged looks of someone who might appear in a magazine ad for the Copenhagen shoe. He always kept wadded under his lip. He was only 24 years old, but he worked with the confidence and sure movements of a seasoned veteran. To DJ, Haas embodied the cowboy spirit of the experienced divers he'd always looked up to. Take charge guys who could be rough and even crude on the job, but who always addressed a lady as ma'am and reflexively pulled out a chair for her. Still, DJ thought to himself, the guy seemed so steely that if need be, he could put a bullet in another man's forehead and then go right back to eating his supper. As the man cage as the man cage neared the bottom, DJ fixed his eyes on a fat ventilation duct that transported air from Deer Island down the shaft and into the tunnel. For years, a bag line had run all nine and a half miles into the tunnel, providing plenty of ambient air to the subterranean workers known as sand hogs. Now the duct ended right where the shaft did, at the very start of the tunnel. DJ had heard that the sand hugs had spent nearly a decade mining the tunnel, twice as long as planned, and that the contractor was tens of millions of dollars in the red. The fact that he and the other divers were being called in during the final hour was itself evidence that something had gone seriously wrong. After all, the divers were being asked to finish the job, even though the ventilation, electricity, and transportation systems, the infrastructure that had kept the sand hogs alive, had already been removed from the tunnel. DJ couldn't tell if the project's bosses viewed his crew as their cavalry or as the equivalent of a Hail Mary pass. The few sandhogs still hanging around on Deer Island certainly seemed to resent the divers' arrival, as though it signified a failing on their part. When the divers suffered the delay after one of the equipment trailers was damaged, a veteran sandhog had reacted with exasperation, asking, how long is it gonna take to fix it? Haas hadn't missed a beat in putting the guy in his place. Well, I'll tell you what, he said, smiling with a wad of chew bulging under his lip. It ain't gonna take nine years. At the base of the shaft, it was cold, about 50 degrees, and misty. There was a decent amount of light and air there, but when DJ let his eyes wander east into the tunnel, they quickly got lost in the dark. 
To him, it looked like the very center of a black hole. So that's, that's the, um, the East Coast guys from Waltham and uh, Wolfboro, New Hampshire, these guys, DJ and Billy. The West Coast guys, Riggs, Tim, and Haas. Riggs, uh, we heard about Tim. Tim is an interesting guy because he's, um, he's a big, um, easygoing guy uh, who's 39 years old and just, you could not ruffle Tim. Um, he's a Texan, uh, a hunter, um, but he'd also devised a series of pulleys to feed the birds in his backyard, and he regularly hand-fed a mother raccoon and her babies. He built a small wooden coffin for one of his cats when she died, holding a graveside memorial service that the neighborhood dogs sat through silently in the rain. To him, animals were creatures that deserved loving care. That was why, as much as he loved guns, he had little interest in hunting. So it, this is the kind of the complications of, of these guys. You sort of think you, you kind of know all of them, but, but they're all really you know, surprising and interesting guys. Um, so just quickly, um, this is, sorry. The idea then is, um, let's come up with a uh, plan to get these divers in. Let's get them moving across uh, deep into the tunnel as far as we can go. Uh, and when the tunnel chokes down, uh, we then they'll go on, on foot. But they take these uh, retrofitted Humvees and they have two, one facing in one direction and for the ride out and one facing in, uh, in the opposite direction for the ride back because once you get nine miles into the tunnel there's not even enough room to open the doors all the way so there's no way to turn them around so that was the plan to get them out and then once they go two guys stay in the Humvee and monitor this breathing system while the three guys trudge on foot to the very end of the tunnel remember no oxygen no light um, and you're on foot and it's getting smaller and smaller. And then you've got to, at the end, crawl through those 30 inch wide pipes to remove those plugs, extricate them, all while you're sort of maintaining your breathing system. And the breathing system, because this is so far out, and this becomes key to this as well, um, there was a, a Canadian engineer who'd kind of uh, been a sort of boy wonder on some other jobs for the contractor who was uh, brought in to design a system. And because it was so far out, the normal supplies of air that you would take would be bottled air, um, HP air, you know, if you're familiar with that. Uh, these are pre-tested um, air that comes in tanks and you just breathe off there. Uh, but it was too far out. That would use up too much of your supply just getting there. Um, so uh, working with some consultants, this engineer came up with a plan to use liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen. Um, because you can get a lot more out of liquid if you carry in just what you need and then turn it to gas. You vaporize it right there in the tunnel and then breathe that mix. As it was presented, it had this military special ops feel to it. Um, and that was appealing to the divers. Some of these guys were military guys. It was appealing to everyone who looked at the plan because it looked really um, just dynamic and, and, and cutting edge. That's the mixer, and those are the liquid tanks. This is footage in the tunnel when there's still light and when there's still transportation. This is the trail going through the rail car. And those are those 30-inch pipes that you've got to crawl onto. That's the, that's the depth. At the end, where it gets really small, five feet in diameter. The difference between how the plan was presented and how it actually showed up turns out to be enormous. 
And that gets at another issue in this of how, how do you know? You know, uh, uh, especially in complicated jobs, especially when there's concern from all the parties. Um, as one engineer told me for the construction manager, there's a fear if I comment too much on this plan, my guys own it. My guys have the new legal responsibility. So when it's presented to me, I might just say, as he did, no objections. Um, that's as far as you'd go on that. So a lot of, early on in the project, a lot of scrutiny uh, went into a lot of these key decisions. But at the end, everyone's tired. Everyone's suspicious of the other parties. And, um, uh, and there's, uh, in some cases, rightly so, because people have been burned by different parties and other things on there. Uh, so it, it, it leads to uh, people not asking as many tough questions as, the, as they had before. And the plan turns out to look like this. Um, sort of uh, a roughly sort of constructed uh, pieces of plywood, valves that kind of bump up against each other, very cramped space. Um, not what you think about for a first of its kind, um, most, one of the most dangerous jobs uh, ever undertaken. Communications become cues. This is the engineer. Um, and when the, the, uh, the first two days on the job, things aren't working well, the, the guys, the dive team are expressing, that they're, they're a little bit slow because they're dealing with, uh, for this to dawn on them of just how different this is because they're all dealing with different work that they haven't, different equipment, different style that they haven't done before. Um, and, uh, but there's a sense of impending doom. So I'm just going to do one quick reading and then I think we'll wrap up um, and start to take some questions. My sisters, it, can you tell me what this is here? Can you see it? The miraculous medal. And what's the significance of the miraculous medal? Yeah. So let me just read a second. So this is what, um, on the night before, uh, so on night before day three of the job. Day one and day two, things aren't going well, uh, but the diver's concerns aren't being, list yeah, aren't being heard. Um, the, that, that communication flow is, is not getting past the, the project manager, engineer on this. So they all go home Tuesday night with different levels of um, worry about what's happening. DJ, when he arrives home at his duplex apartment in Waltham, that he shared with his mother, she was waiting up for him. With her squinty eyed smile and a throaty laugh that testified to her longtime Benson and Hedges habit, Lorraine was an interesting mix. Despite the endearing brogue and almost courtly manner she maintained from her days growing up on a farm in Nova Scotia, adulthood had toughened her into a wary survivor. DJ knew how well his mother could read him after all they'd been through. It'd be no use trying to mask the misery that he'd seen in the tunnel that day or the apprehension he felt about tomorrow. He didn't want to get her riled up, though, so he tried to spin his anxiousness into a positive way. He knew how much strength his mother drew from her Catholic faith. Many a Sunday night, he would walk her the few blocks from their house to St. Charles Church for the 7 o'clock Mass. And he certainly knew how much he adored her late father, the strapping carpenter who was the central character in most of Lorraine's favorite childhood stories. While driving home that night, DJ had recalled one particular story his mother had told him more than once. It involved his grandfather's time as a carpenter helping to erect Boston's 52-story Prudential Tower, which when it opened in 1964 was the tallest building in North America outside of New York. No matter how high above the ground he was, DJ's grandfather had said he'd never felt afraid because he kept the Virgin Mary medal in his pocket. Lorraine had come into possession of that miraculous medal sort of accidentally. She'd always loved the smell of pipe smoke because it reminded her of her dad. After he died, her mother had given Lorraine her dad's tobacco pouch as a memento and nestled deep inside that aromatic pouch, Lorraine had found the miraculous medal. 
Now standing in the living room, DJ asked his mother, you know Grandpa's medal? Is that still around? Lorraine felt a nod in her stomach as soon as the question came out of her son's mouth. With her thin eyebrows arched, she asked him why he wanted it. When DJ replied, I'm a little concerned about the job, she could tell he was trying to backpedal a bit. He could downplay things all he wanted, but he was already gotten, she had already gotten the message. Lorraine said nothing as she climbed the stairs and fished the metal out of the drawer in the bedroom nightstand. She held it in her hand, gently buffing it with her thumb. It may have been called the miraculous metal, but it didn't look like much. Silver in color and oval in shape, it wasn't much larger than a safety pin. There was a loop at the top of it so it could be worn on a necklace or a chain. In the center was a picture in relief of the Blessed Mother, arms out, halo around her head. Around that image was the message, O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have the recourse to thee. As anxious as DJ's request made her, Lorraine was, uh, wasn't about to add to her son's burden by forcing him to worry about her fears. She had faith that the Virgin Mother would wrap her protective arms around DJ in the same way she'd always watched over his grandfather. Lorraine descended the stairs and headed back into the living room. DJ, dear, she said, handing her son the medal. Be careful not to lose this. So that's... I know, I'm just, that's Tuesday night before they go in on Wednesday. And Wednesday is when um, things go bad in the tunnel. Uh, and I think I'm supposed to stop and take some questions on it now. So I don't mean to leave you hanging there. Um, so I can read one more section if you, if you want. Um, do we want or no? All right, and I need a drink. All right, so this is Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning actually starts out better than any of the other two mornings. And there's always this line that the divers can't tell if the problems that they're feeling are just kinks in the system that just need to be worked out. This happens a lot on jobs. Or if they're fundamental flaws. Wednesday morning sort of suggests to them that they might just be kinks. Uh, they get an early start, the thing seems to go well, they've got muscle memory now on how it moves. They have to take this Humvee, uh, it takes almost two hours just to drive to as far as the Humvees can go. After that slow two hour drive, they can't go very fast. The lead Humvee reaches the nine and a quarter mile mark beyond which it could go no farther. Billy and Tim remain planted inside the vehicle, monitoring the breathing system for all five divers while DJ, Riggs, and Haas begin their trek on foot. The three guys remain connected through about 1,500 feet of hose to the air system back in the Humvee. The hose was called an umbilical because a diver could not survive with it at, without it any longer than a baby in the womb could survive without hers. It took DJ, Riggs, and Haas 20 minutes to trudge with their gear about 1,100 feet. Haas positioned himself outside the final stretch of the tunnel just before its width shrank to five feet. His job was to watch over the connections to the main breathing system and use a communications wire to call in periodic updates to Tim back in the Humvee. DJ and Riggs slogged onward, duck walking several hundred feet more to the tunnel's end. Once there, Riggs took the, on the toughest assignment, shimmying deep into the slimy, skinny connector pipe to remove a heavy safety plug. With DJ's help, he would need to repeat that task 54 times. To most people, the claustrophobia inside that cramped black space so far from civilization would be paralyzing. The pipe Briggs had to crawl through measured just 30 inches across, not much wider than his shoulders. And he had to be careful not to jostle the cumbersome breathing gear that was keeping him alive. Not long after Riggs emerged from the pipe, Haas noticed that the diver's umbilicals had become dangerously tangled. He instructed DJ and Riggs to get their hoses straightened out before doing anything else. As Haas began his own untangling effort, he looked up to see something startling. DJ was collapsing onto the floor, the tunnel floor, in a strange kind of involuntary slow motion. Are you okay, DJ? Haas yelled, muffled through his face mask. Before he could finish his sentence, Riggs went down next, falling on one knee in front of DJ. Haas suddenly felt lightheaded himself in a warm and fuzzy way 
as though he had just tossed back a few cocktails. He had enough presence of mind to know that warm and fuzzy was not how you wanted to be feeling when you were buried under the sea, miles from land. I need to call Tim, he said. When you reached Tim on the comm wire, Haas pressed him for what the oxygen content was in their main breathing supply. Anything below 19% meant trouble. Tim said he and Billy would check. A few seconds later, Tim called back. Shit, it's 8.9, he shouted frantically. Then the line went dead. Okay, um, I guess I should stop there, right? No? Uh, why don't we just see if there are questions now? People have questions? Yes? Okay, many really procedural things. I'm, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm surprised that they were trying to go on hands and knees in those small sections. You know, I mean, one thing, you know, mechanics have uh, you know, these real things that they uh, that they use to slide under cars, and it seems to me that you just um, being able to roll yourself along on one of those would be uh, an easier trip. Yeah. Uh, any was there any particular reason they they did or didn't consider that? So what, what those guys, uh, so the question, I'm supposed to repeat the questions, right? Why, w w weren't there things like, uh, um, what do mechanics call that? Does anyone know that word? Creeper. The creeper. Weren't there creepers or, um, uh, that they could have used to make this process easier at the very end of the, uh, of the tunnel? Um, uh, what they did um, to get from where the Humvees were parked when they were walking on foot to the end, they had this um, boat that they carried with them, and it had these uh, collapsible wheels on it. So they, it's almost like a stretcher on an ambulance. Um, and so where it was dry, uh, because again, there was standing water and not standing water. Where it was dry, they'd have the wheels. Where it was wet, they would just drag it through the water. Um, that carried their gear, the manifold for their breathing system. Um, it also was going to be used to bring the plugs back. Remember, they have to take these 65 pump plugs and they have to bring them back. So that's what they take to get out there. As far as getting inside these 30 inch wide um, pipes in there, the it's such a slimy situa surface in there that you can pretty much slide yourself through there. The creeper I don't think would have helped in a meaningful way on there. Um, uh, because it also would have just been more space where there's not much space. In fact, the choreography of getting those plugs out was pretty astounding because um, uh, the diver would have to get the piece, the, the sort of circlip that was holding this plug in place and then slide it through down and push it out by by his legs and these various pieces and then kind of slide out holding the actual piece on there. So yeah, there was just no room to move in there. There was no extra space for anything. Yes, sir. I'm sort of like, once they take a plug out, wouldn't the water Great question. So yeah. Um, the question is, once they take the plug out, won't they be a gushing tidal wave coming in? And remember, this is the second or, th depending on how you count it, or third level of protection. These were the secondary seals. So and that diffuser head that sits on the ocean floor had been designed in a mushroom shape so that if an anchor dragging along the ocean hit it, it there would be nothing to catch. So that was the, f the design of it was the first level. Each of those diffuser heads had these, um, uh, um, sprinklers on them and those had covers on them that it was intended at the end of the project will send divers down to swim down and take those off. So those two levels are there. So it's only um, this one that's nestled in that they need to get out so once they take those other ones out it can move through there. Yes, you had a question? Someone else. Yeah, that's similar. I, uh, I'm hearing the story for the first time. Um, that was a key issue on there. So one of the things I explore a lot in the book is the the, there's a whole chapter called Memo Wars, which were the, were the the coming attractions for this the, the problem here on that, where, where these various parties couldn't get along for a couple of years seeing this. Basically, the contractor bid this job without really thinking very much about 
these plugs um, because they had to build the world's longest dead-end tunnel. They had to make it match and connect perfectly with another joint venture building these risers at the other end. There were just so many engineering challenges that this seemed like a sort of an afterthought. It was a line item in something on there here, as, as, as the contractor admitted to me later. We never really thought about it. And if we did think about it, we thought we'd just take those out as we were backing out of the tunnel. Um, and that's what the contractor wanted to do. For a year, it said, and for more than a year, it said, the contractor said, we got to take these plugs out while we're backing out. Um, uh, and um, but here's the other problem. So the other, the construction manager and the designer, these other firms, um, see in that mo motivation, because they've already had these problems with this contractor, they see the contractor trying to save money there. Um, because it was cheaper, they already have crews in there to pull it out. So what's going on there? And if something, even if it's an infinitesimal chance of it, if, if a disaster happens, and we've signed off on those plugs coming out early, we own that risk rather than the contractor. As it stands now, if the contractor follows the letter of the law of the contract, they own that risk. So this became a risk assessment issue and a risk offloading issue from, from various parties. And, and this is one of the things that has been most meaningful to me from people involved in the project who've read the book now who've said, it's really important to see this now to connect the real people who actually do these things because you get so locked into these battles for good reason um, with entities, with one entity fighting another. And then you think, all right, uh, someone call in a dive team thinking that that's a kind of a, a, a conceptual idea of call in a dive team rather than DJ, Riggs, Billy, Tim, Haas. That's not a conceptual thing. Those are real people on there. So that, that important, thing, you know, and a couple of these people have said, we, we think young engineers and public policy people should have to read the book to sort of be reminded of that, which I think is um, great to kind of make that connection because nothing is built on paper. Bu things are built by real people. Yes? Oh. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, there is, it's all about, it's, it, again, it's about risk assessment. Um, uh, so do you endanger, if there are 100 sand hogs working on there for 9 or 10 years, do you endanger them, even if it's a very tiny risk, because you've got a higher number of people, a larger number of people uh, working on there for a longer period, or do you give them an extra level of protection but put a very small group of people to an extraordinary risk? And that's kind of those calculations that are made. But again, those calculations are often divorced from the actual people involved. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, between the time that you wrote the first article, that was in, I guess, Globe Magazine, yep. right, and the book, what was it more that you wanted to find out or what more about the story did you want to tell and expand it into a full-size book? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the question is, because I wrote about this originally in the Globe Magazine um, five years ago, um, uh, what made me want to turn it into a book. And it's interesting. I mean, I, I feel like I'm very lucky at the Globe to be able to sink into topics uh, as a magazine writer, to find out everything I can about them, and then to move on. Um, and and with this story, I couldn't move on. I just, it kept playing in my head. And a couple of big questions came into that, sort of knowing the really smart bright, well-intentioned people who were involved in this, who did this cleanup, designed and built and led through the, the political um, maze to get this made that makes life better for all of us. How very smart people can make those bad decisions that lead um, to create this risk for these guys. What Where these guys came from to be able to get to know them and, the, and that story. Um, uh, and the subcultures of, um, people who build tunnels, people who design tunnels, uh, people who 
do commercial diving. I mean, these are worlds that um, I became fascinated with because this became an opportunity to understand how the world really works around us. You know, we sort of don't, we sort of take it for granted, I think, in a way, because anything can look good on a computer screen now and anything seems possible. At the same time, we all think government can't do anything anymore, right? I mean, it's been so diminished and derided. And so here's an example of, of government and public policy people doing a very impossible job, seeing it through to completion for the betterment of all of us. But the workers who actually were asked to take on this enormous risk that they really didn't have to be, how could that happen? And what do we learn from that? So we're doing in, in these other, any other project we tackle to understand that we sort of owe them to, to learn these lessons. So those things um, really sort of kept sort of uh, spiraling around in my head until I could kind of keep exploring this. Yes? So along those same lines, um, as much as this is a, a new story, it's an old story. Um, you have like people building the Panama Canal and you have people uh, you know, up building the Empire State Building. And today we have regulatory suspensions, regulatory agencies like OSHA. And so the more things change, the more they need to stay the same, right? So going forward, you've been with this group for a long time, talking to a couple of guys that are so it's a really good question and then um, uh, let me answer it quickly and then Doug might want to answer it as well um, the, the question it was w do I think this will happen again um, uh, and or, or do people learn from these lessons? And one of the reasons I wrote the book was so people can learn from the particulars of this, because the particulars are very specific to this case and probably won't be repeated. But the forces at work, I think, are universal to any complex undertaking. So I think we deserve, uh, we need to know all about these things and to understand those. And there were uh, there was um, systematic failures on this point to lead to this. It's sort of like um, the, the, if people know the Swiss cheese theory of, of, of uh, disasters happening, it's not by one massive mistake. It's by a series of small mistakes. Any one of them wouldn't be enough to, to create disaster. But when they all line up and the holes in the Swiss cheese line up, that's when disaster can happen. And that, so understanding those things and understanding, for me, the thing I look around now, I sort of think, how many things have just one thin layer of cheese protecting us from this kind of disaster? Um, I do think, you know, that used to be when people were doing tunneling jobs, there used to be this sort of chilling kind of shorthand, which was a man a mile. You build a 10 mile tunnel, you should expect to lose 10 men. That was sort of the thinking for a, lo a long part of the you know, uh, 19th and 20th century. Um, thankfully, we've moved far beyond that for a couple of reasons. One, for the human toll, but also the financial toll is enormous when you, and it, as it should be, when you, when you lose workers on, on the job. So I think people do try, and what I've been struck by is the people in this story have learned from this job here and how they've um, approached future jobs and um, with uh, pretty remarkable success on other jobs that they've worked in some of these same parties work together um, on other complex jobs without losing a single worker so that's pretty impressive on there however um, no one really talks about it except internally because of litigation and because of fears about things and because of concerns about airing dirty laundry. I went down to New Orleans a few weeks ago to speak to the National Divers Diving Contractor Company con uh, Association, the big conference they had. And um, the executive director there is sort of saying, we need to talk about these things um, and use this as a, as a kind of teaching example because so often people are are prevented from exploring these things and really learning from them. They do internally, but they don't in their connections because of those other concerns that happen. One of the things that um, uh, Tim's wife, why she asked me, she wanted to see Doug at this. This is the person she wanted to meet and talk to because she was impressed with how open he was and how reflective he was and how interested he was in learning from this in the book.
and she wanted to come up and, and, and she initiated that and it was pretty moving on that because that's um, pretty remarkable on, on his leadership part. He's also responsible for probably adding months if not a year on this project to me just by sending me down all these historical rabbit holes of Deer Island and the, the, the history of the Bolsheviks on Deer Island and other things. Fascinating stuff that ultimately Amanda let me leave one paragraph in I think. But uh, um, <laughs> Oh, don't tell me. I don't have time for this. I, I, I can't lose another six months of my life, Doug, but thank you. All right, I think we have one last question. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, speaking of lessons learned, any perspective on why not just tunnel project, but why uh, in Boston we can't plan, budget, and deliver projects without them running wildly over? <laughs> well, yeah, I would say a couple of things on that. One is the overall um, harbor cleanup project um, is remarkable for a number of reasons. One is this tunnel project was over budget and beyond deadline on that, but the overall harbor cleanup, largely because of Doug's leadership, came in under budget. It was supposed to be $6 billion. It came in around $4 billion, or so less than $4 billion. So it's unheard of to sort of bring a huge, complicated project, especially one that is sort of uh, embedded uh, with all these difficult problems in there. The big dig is a different story. Um, so, so, so that's um, one thing on there. But I, I, I do feel that um, uh, in terms of, um, I did want to mention one lesson on there. Maybe this this is a good way because it's sort of like news you can use. Something that I, I've. Um, uh, if, uh, it, I've taken to heart in my own life on this. Um, there's a couple of themes I deal with it in the end of uh, of these wider lessons, and one of them is called normalization. Um, which if there are business school people in there, you, you probably have heard it. I hadn't been familiar with it until I had to do reading about it for this. But um, uh, it's a um, this it's this idea of um, the more you do something risky. Um, and don't suffer uh, negative uh, effects from it or negative outcome, the less attuned you become to understanding the risk. You know, sort of, and, and I think Doug was the one who originally told me about this analogy, which is just sticks with me, which is cleaning your gutters. So if any of you clean your gutters, you, you, you take the ladder, you climb up, um, you reach a little bit over here, you reach a little bit over here, and then you climb down and you move it four feet and you climb up and you reach a little here and you reach a little here. And you do that if you're sensible and want to not break a leg or die, you keep doing that. Until you get to kind of the last run of the gutters around the back and you want to go watch the Patriots and you're thirsty and you've had no problem so far with this. So what do you do for that last run? You reach a little bit more over here, and then you reach a little bit more over here, and that's when the ladder breaks. And that's when the ladder falls apart and you break a leg or worse on there. That, those accidents for gutters, uh, cleaning gutters, always happen at the end, not at the beginning, because you get a little cocky, you get a little complacent, and um, you, you forget, and you, and you also, um, you're feeling time pressure to kind of finish the job on there. And that's why it, it, it's kind of a, a very counterintuitive. You think, I went into this thinking, what's the most dangerous day on a complicated job? I thought the first couple of days on the job where people are still sorting out, they don't know each other that well. It's not true. It's the last day on the job or the last phase of projects where fatalities uh, disproportionately happen because of that normalization, because of, you know, the reaching on the gutter. And on, the, the, on this, this piece was at the very end of this. The other deaths on this project were all at the very end of that particular phase on there. So that's another thing in terms of learning from safety and the, and the kind of improvements that um, Doug uh, and his leadership has put through um, uh, in other projects that have kept workers safe has been to understand that, to understand these counterintuitive um, forces at work so that you can be extra cautious at the end rather than um, less cautious. So I guess we gotta wrap up there now. But thank you so much all for coming and for the great questions.